Hey, welcome to part two on our segment related to African art. Um, in this video, we're going to be looking at African sculpture. Um, despite the numerous sculptural traditions in Africa, there are certain conventions. Um, usually, sculptures are portable, um, and um, larger sculptures, um, the kind that grace the plazas of ancient Egypt or, Ro or Rome, are um, unknown. Um, wood is usually the favorite material for sculpture. Um, trees were honored as symbolically repaid, uh, were, were honored and symbolically repaid for branches taken from them. Ivory is used um, um, as a sign of rank or prestige, and then metal shows strength and durability and is restricted to royalty. And then the use of stone is extremely rare. Figures are basically frontal, drawn full face with a, a tension um, paid to sides. Symmetry is occasionally used, but more sophisticated artists vary their approach on each side of the object. Um, artists don't usually work with, with preliminary sketches and, and just really work directly onto the wood or whatever um, media they're using. Um, and again, the, the figures are often very stylized. Um, sometimes, um, you know, certain features are exaggerated or disproportionate disproportionately larger or smaller, sort of depending on um, maybe the re religious or ritual um, significance of the figure. Um, sometimes sexual characteristics are also exaggerated, you know, in terms of maybe fertility, you know, to um, promote ideas of fertility. Sometimes we see um, multiple media being used. It's common to see a wood sculpture adorned with feathers, fabric, or beads. Um, African sculptors prefer um, geo, sort of geometric forms. Um, it generally avoids physical reality or sort of depicting, you know, like this idea of historical specificity. So often, you know, we see things that are very stylized, um, geometric, um, you know, like Picasso. You know, remember Picasso was very influenced by African sculpture um, and masks. Um, and, and this idea is because, you know, they're representing the spiritual world. Um, so, anyway. So, this is one of the first sculptures that we're going to be looking at. Um, it's a brass plaque dated between 1550 and 1680. And it depicts an Oba, O-B-A, and this is the king um, and his attendants from the Benin Empire. This was a powerful kingdom located in present-day Nigeria. We know that the central figure is the Oba because of his distinct coral beaded regalia, which you see right here, and um, also his attendants um, that hold shields above his head, um, either to protect him from attack or possibly from the hot tropical sun. This was a privilege only afforded to an Oba. The figures around him range in size, not because of their actual height or distance from the Oba, but rather due to their level of importance within the court. And so, you again, this use of higher Arctic scale. Um, we saw this with other ancient cultures. Um, this convention of sizing human um, figures based on um, status, again, is known as higher Arctic scale and is found in artwork from cultures around the world and across time. Um, Egypt, we saw it with ancient Near Eastern art. The Oba would have traveled with a large um, cohort of attendants, warriors, servants, diplomats, um, chieftains, and priests. The plaque originally hung alongside many others on posts throughout the palace of the Oba. The order of their placement on the post would have told the story of the royal lineage of Benin's Obas, um, who traced their dynasty all the way back to Oranmian, whose son was the first Oba of Benin. However, the sequence of the plaques is lost to us since they were long held in storage when found by Westerners in the 19th century. You may notice that the Oba rides side saddle um, on a horse on horseback, which would seem to indicate a connection to Oba SCG. Um, e S I G I E, who ruled um, circa 1504 to 1550. Um, he was the first Oba to travel by horse, so that's why they think it might represent him. However, without knowing the original order of the plaques, we will never know for certain whether this is a CG or a later Oba who, who emulated his brash new mode of travel. Artists working in brass were organized under a CG. Today, artists working in brass in Benin are part of a brass workers' guild, 
and it was likely that previous generations would have also worked collectively. These artists create, created plaques and other sculptures using what is known as the lost wax casting technique, in which um, first a more malleable wax version of the final brass work is made. It is then covered in clay and fired to harden the clay, and fired to harden the clay, removing the wax which melts away in the process, hence the form or the term lost wax. Hot molten liquid brass is then poured into the clay mold. As the brass cools, it hardens and the clay is removed, revealing the finished plaque. Almost every detail in this work speaks to the Benin Kingdom's mutually beneficial trade with Portugal, which first made contact with Benin in the late 15th century. The Portuguese received items like peppers, um, cloth, stone beads from Benin, while Benin received, among other items, the coral that make up the beads worn by the Oba in his necklace, and even the brass that makes up this plaque in the form of um, manilas or armbands worn by the Portuguese, um, which would have been melted down as the raw material for this plaque. So this is a contextual photograph. Um, this is a, a contemporary um, Oba, um, uh, Benin Oba and his attendants. And as you can see, the photo is very similar to the arrangement of the figures depicted in the plaque. So we can see that this tradition um, has, has um, been going on for quite some time. Um, and, and these are the armbands um, that I spoke about earlier. So these would have been melted down um, and then um, used for the plaque. So we'll look at some details. Um, the rosette shapes that adorn the background of the plaque were possibly derived from Christian crosses brought by these European traders. Even the horse that the Oba rides was originally introduced to West Africa from across the sea. This is nothing quite like these plaques. There's nothing quite like these plaques in all of Africa or Europe from this period, and some scholars speculate that they were created as a way of reconciling traditional African brass sculptural forms with the illustrated books and prints they may have that may have been in possession of the European travelers. So they thought maybe these plaques were sort of influenced by this these ideas of these books um, and illustrations um, or illuminated manuscripts that um, these Europeans carried with them. So Trade began to decline with Portugal as the Portuguese empire waned in the 18th century. By the 19th century, Britain was seeking to make inroads with Benin, a new trading partner. However, this partnership was much, much less ben mutually beneficial and was marked with frequent tension. After increased aggression from both nations, the British launched the punitive expedition of 1897, seizing the Oba's palace, burning down the city around it, killing many, and looting the royal court's vast... Um, um, collection of art and treasure. So as you can see, there's there's sort of a troubled legacy that's been left. So we know this plaque was one of the artworks artworks looted in the siege because of Norman Burroughs, a known trafficker in stolen Benin objects. Um, he owned it briefly during this time. This act of looting perpetuated by the British was later condemned as a crimin as criminal and a violent act of British imperialism and um, colonialism. As such, there are many who believe that objects such as this plaque should be returned to the people of Benin, who remain deeply connected to their history and cultural traditions. However, there are others who feel that these remarkable objects are part of the world's heritage and thus should remain in museum collections around the world um, as a testament to this artistically rich culture. And so these are some dilemmas and some of these sort of um, ethical issues that museums um, have to deal with um, in terms of how they acquired the artwork and sometimes the way museums and how artwork ends up in collections um, um, usually has been a result of um, looting or, or it having, having been stolen or, um, you, know, in, you know, absconded from another culture that's been oppressed in some way. All right, so this is our next um, sculpture or artifact. It's called, um, it's, it's translation, I'm not even going to try to pronounce it, is the Golden Stool. Um, it's um, from the Asante people, um, present-day Ghana, and it dates around 1700. 
Um, so the golden stool is a royal and divine throne of the Ashanti people. According to the legend, Okomofo Anoki, um, high priest and one of the two chief founders of the Ashanti Confederacy, caused um, the stool to descend from the sky and land on the lap of the first Asante king, um, Ose Tutu. Such seats were traditionally symbolic of a chieftain's leadership, but the golden stool is believed to house the spirit of, a, of the Asante nation. And so it represents the nation, it represents the living citizens, the dead, um, and the future, um, the future um, children who have yet to be born. Um, so this is this is a contextual photograph to show you um, how it is um, used or presented, um, and it's hard. I couldn't really find a good um, picture of it, but um, here it is, um, and you can see it's made out of gold. Um, it's never actually used as a stool, and it's never allowed to touch the ground. Um, it's carried to the king um, on a pillow, and only the king is allowed to touch it. Um, the entire surface is inlaid with gold, and then these bells hang from the side um, to warn the king of danger. Many wars have broken out over the ownership of the royal throne. In 1896, Ashante um, Primafe the I was deported um, rather than risking the losing than ra rather than risk losing both the war and the throne. That's some sort of historical context. In 1900, Sir Fredrickson Hodginson, the governor of the Gold Coast, so again, this is, you know, a result of colonization, demanded to be allowed to sit on the golden stool and ordered that a, a search for it be conducted. Um, this provoked an armed rebellion known as the War of the Golden Stool, which resulted in the annexation of Ashanti to the British Empire. Um, but preserve the sanctity of the golden stool. Um, in 1921, African road workers discovered this stool um, and stripped some of the gold ornaments from it. Um, they were taken into protective custody by the British before being um, tried according to local customs and sentenced to death. So um, these are people who, who stripped the piece. Um, the British intervened, and the group was instead banished. Um, an insurance of non-interference with the stool was then given by the British, and it was um, brought out of hiding. In 1935, the stool was used in a ceremony to crown Osi Tutu Agamen um, Primef II, and I know I'm completely butchering those names. Um, the golden stool is um, a curved seat, 46 centimeters high, with a platform of 61 centimeters wide and 30 centi um, centimeters deep. Um, again, its surface is inlaid with gold. It's hung with bells, again, to warn the king of impending danger. Um, it has been seen by many, but only the king, um, queen, and, and the true prince, Ofasu Se Boki, um, and trusted advisors um, know the hiding place of it, so apparently it gets hidden. Um, replicas have um, been produced for the chief, um, and at their funerals um, are ceremonial, ceremonially blackened with animal blood, a symbol of their power of generation. The stool is one of the main focal points of the Asante today because it still shows succession and power. Each stool is made from a single block of wood, of Alstonian Booney. Um, it's a tall forest tree with numerous associations and carved with a crescent-shaped seat, flat base, and complex support structure. The many designs and symbolic meanings um, mean that every stool is unique, each having a different meaning for the person whose soul it seats. Some designs contain animal shapes or images that recall the person who used it, the general shape of the Asante stool has been copied by other cultures and sold worldwide. They also would rub an oil on the wood part of it um, to kind of um, give it a sheen. Right. So we're going to be looking at some portrait sculpture. Um, in all world cultures, artists honor remarkable leaders by creating lasting works of art in their honor. Historical leaders in the West um, like Alexander the Great, um, we saw a lot of Roman Republican um, 
portraiture. We've seen numerous examples of portrait painting um, in many different um, historical periods in art history. Um, and, you know, they're really meant to sort of um, create a legacy for that person being um, represented and also um, to um, celebrate the accomplishments of, of their lifetime. Um, and, you know, they're remembered through um, that work of art, um, which is created to preserve, again, their legacy. Um, during the first half of the 18th century, the Kuba King Misha Mishang Mabul was celebrated throughout his kingdom for his generosity and for the great number of his loyal subjects. He was even the recipient of his own praise song. Um, at the height of his reign in 1710, he commissioned an idealized portrait statue, statue called a um, dop in DOP. With the commission of his um, dop, um, Mishi Mishang <laughs> Mabul recorded his reign for posterity and solidified his accomplishments among the pa um, his pantheon and the um, his predecessors. Um, the, the DOP was um, portray, portrayed his likeness, was eventually purchased by the Brooklyn Museum in 1961 and has been on view at the museum since that time. It was first collected in 1909 by a colonial minister in what was then um, the Belgian Congo, um, the European country's colony. So, um, why are Mache, Mache, Maboul, and others commemorated, commemorated in the arts of African of Africa are largely unknown to us. Um, unlike in European contexts, history in sub-Saharan Africa was not written down by members of cultural communities until colonialism in the late 19th and early 20th century. Instead of written records, oral narrative was the primary method of collective and um, personal histories to be passed down from one generation to the next. As these spoken histories were passed down, they were changed and adapted to reflect their time. The changing nature of oral, oral narrative, narrative is like a highly complex game of telephone, where the words can be changed, and often only the spirit of the original meaning is, and often the, the spirit of the original meaning is preserved. Before being purchased by Western collectors and museums, African sculptors. Um, served as an important historical uh, sculptures served as an important historical marker within their communities. The um, DOP or NADOP, I'm not sure how you say it, um, sculptural record helps freeze a moment in time that would otherwise be transformed during its transmission from generation to generation. When we look at these sculptures and museums, it is important to remember that they were created about and for individuals. Since information and history was transferred orally in Africa, sculptural tradition like the Nadop um, can help us gain insight into information about historical individuals and their cultural ideas. Okay. Um, the Cuba artists, um, we'll, we'll talk about that, lived in the Democratic Republic of the Congo of the southern fringes of the um, equatorial forest in an area bound by two rivers called the Kasi and Sakuro, over a period of three centuries of movement and exchange beginning in the 17th century, this loose confederacy of people formed into a durable kingdom. Since that time, the name Cuba largely refers to um, 19 unique but, um, unique but related ethnic groups, all of which acknowledge the leadership of the same leader, Nayem, N-Y-I-M. The Cuba are renowned for a dynamic artistic legacy across the media. Um, historically, Cuba artists are professional wood carvers, blacksmiths, and weavers who work exclusively for the Nayem. Cuba artists learned their art by becoming apprentices to others who were well known and accomplished in their communities. Um, similar to art traditions in other world cultures, the apprentices imitated or copied earlier pieces from their teachers until they were skilled enough to develop their own designs. Although the names of individual artists were not written down, and are not known to us today. Artists who sought, artists were sought after by name and were important to the Cuba royal court and beyond. 
So, Nadop sculpture. The Nadop statues might be the most um, revered of all Cuba art forms. Um, the Nadop literally, literally means statue, um, or a genre of figurative wood sculptures that portray important Cuba leaders throughout the 18th to 20th centuries. Art historians believe that there are seven Nadop statues of historical significance in Western museums. These seven are significant because the lives of the Nayim um, they portray were celebrated in oral histories and were recorded and written down by early European visitors. So we know, so we know um, more about them. Um, you can travel to the British Museum in England or the Royal Museum of Central Africa in Belgium um, to see a Nadop. Um, Nadop sculptures that are on view at the British Museum were brought to Europe from Africa by Hungarian ethnog um, ethnographer Emil Torde. Um, Torde and other early visitors to the Cuba court documented oral traditions related to artwork. Art historians have since tried to reconstruct and sort out these early accounts. They use the, sculptures, the sculptures themselves to interpret pre-colonial Cuba history. So let's look at some of the um, sort of stylistic conventions. Um, Nadop sculptures have very rounded contours, creating forms that really define the head, shoulders, and stomach. Um, and you can also see how they um, really define the collarbone as well. Um, and they do have a sense of naturalism compared to um, the, the oba plaque or the brass plaque that we looked at earlier. Um, definitely, um, it's not an exact likeness, but it definitely has a more natural feel. Um, and so there is a sense that they are maybe um, informed by one-to-one um, -one observation, um, but again, they're not exact likenesses, um, and they probably are not um, actually created from direct observation. Instead, there are certain cultural conventions um, and visual um, predecents um, that guide the artist in making the sculpture. The expression on the face, the position of the body, and the regalia were meant to faith faithfully represent the idea of a king. So a cross current you could think of is, um, you know, these statues, these early um, Old Kingdom statues of the Pharaoh. Um, again, they, they had a certain formula in which they portrayed royalty. So this would be a good cross current or comparison. Um, and so again, they're representing uh, the idea of a king, but not an individual king. For example, the facial features of each statue follow sculpting conventions and do not represent features of a specific individual. All figures are sculpted using a one to three proportion. The head of the statue is sculpted to be one third the size of the total statue. Um, Cuba artists emphasized the head because it was considered the seat of intelligence, a valued idea. So this goes back to some of the conventions we talked about with African art, that sometimes they exaggerate or um, have disproportionate um, anatomical features. And again, this relates to some sort of symbolic um, um, reference. Um, so how are we able to identify each um, nadop or statue? Um, there are specific attributes that link each um, nadop to name individuals. All nadop sculptors would um, feature a geometric motif um, and an emblem um, chosen by the Nayim or the king when he was, um, or the leader, when he was installed as a leader um, and had his um, nadop commissioned. The geometric motif pattern um, and the emblem serve as identifying symbols of his reign and was sculpted in prominent relief on the front of each base. So here you can see um, a close-up. Um, the emblem, and it's also referred to as an eyeball, I-B-O-L, is a signifier that gives the Nadop um, its particular identity, making it clear who the sculpture portrays and what reign it represents. A drum with a severed head is the um, ebol or emblem for um, Mache Mashang Mabul's reign, and that helps us identify the sculpture as his likeness. Um, and I, I should have, I, I don't know if I said this, it's a severed hand. I might have said sever, severed head. My apologies. 
Other styles or conventions um, that were followed by sculptors of Nadop can be found in royal regalia, such as belts, armbands, bracelets, and shoulder ornaments, and a unique um, projecting headdress called a shoddy, which you can see here. Um, the arms of each Nadop extend vertically at either side of the torso, with the left, left hand grasping the handle of a ceremonial knife, um, a cool eye. K U L, um, and the right hand resting on the knees. Artists decorated the surface of the sculpture by carving representations of what was conventionally worn. The finely chiseled details correspond to objects that represent um, the prerogative and prestige of the Nayam or the king. Um, the Nadap of Meshi Meshang Mabul is part of a larger genre of figurative wood sculpt sculptures in Kuba art. These sculptures were commissioned by Kuba leaders or Nayam to preserve their accomplishments for posterity. Because transmission of knowledge in this part of Africa is through oral narrative names, um, oral narratives names and histories of the past are often lost. The Nadop sculptures serve as an important marker of cultural ideas. They also reveal a chronological lineage through their visual signifiers. And then here, again, is another sort of contextual photograph of the Nayem. Um, so this would be the leader or the king. And you can see here some of the regalia is similar. Um, he has the shoddy, and then the, there's the drum. So... Anyway, I'm going to stop here. Um, we, we will be looking at some more African sculpture. We're going to be looking at power figures, which are really cool in our next segment, and also looking at some African masks. So stay tuned.